Okay, our next um, speaker um, is Mariela Sanchez. We have From Lakes to Floodplains, the Hydrology of Austin's Fork Creek. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'll be talking about the hydrology of the Austin's um, just to give you kind of an idea of where these wetlands are, um, I'm not sure if most of you have heard or have been to Glendale, um, but it's about, it's an environmental study center and um, partly owned by Walker, um, and it's about seven miles away from campus. Um, so there is a dam, oh, sorry, there is a, a dam, which if you have been there, you, you're probably familiar with it, um, and the wetlands that I studied are actually upstream of that dam, and they're located right around here. So um, the reason why I'm studying these wetlands um, is because of their rich and very interesting history. Um, historic records show that there was a dam put in place about in about the 1830s, um, maybe even as early as the 1770s. And um, after a huge flooding event, uh, the dam was actually rebuilt in the 1920s. And this, the rebuilding of the dam created um, or impounded a 65 acre, acre lake that you can see right here. Um, it was mostly used for recreation, fishing, um, for, for children, and it was a very big part of the Glendale community. I've, I've talked to several people that were, are still alive today that have experienced the mill, the mill pond, so it was very important uh, during that time. Uh, but the textile mill stopped uh, being active, and lack of regulation since the 1960s um, actually caused the caused the dam to be, I mean the, the mill pond to be filled in with sediments, um, causing over time the creation of a floodplain forest and um, a serious series of wetland ecosystems. So as a result of all of this sediment um, being being filled in over time, the floodplain ecosystem is very dynamic. I mean it, it changes in its there's always things happening in the in the wetland. Um, so, after knowing this, the biggest questions that I had uh, that came to mind were: What are the major inputs of water into the wetland, and how does each wetland respond, and what are the factors that affect this dynamic ecosystem? So, the purpose of my study was to assess the influence of surface water and groundwater in two wetlands over a 12-month month period, and because of these two wetlands. Um, are in such close proximity to each other and they have a very similar history of emergence. I hypothesized that the two wetlands are hydraulically connected, um, meaning that they're concurrent in their response to water inputs and do not fluctuate independently from each other. So the, my two wetlands of study, um, I kind of named them for fun. Uh, the one that is closest to the dam, so further downstream, is Beaver, it's this one, and it's located in a slight topographic depression. Um, it has more seasonal plants and not as much tree cover. This is a picture of beaver. As you can see, it's more open. It has a lot of more open, um, it's a, a more open area and it has more seasonal plants. As compared to dragonfly, which is up here, it has um, a less variation in topographic relief and less seasonal plant, or less seasonal plants and more extensive tree, tree cover. So what I found was that, as you can see um, here in these lines represent the water levels, um, and I measured the water levels for a period of a year. Um, I found that the two wetlands seems to have very similar responses during periods of standing water and no standing water. Um, <coughs> perhaps the most interesting thing that I found was that uh, the biggest differences were seen during seasonal transitions. So Beaver, which is the wetland most downstream, actually filled in quicker um, and more rapidly than the dragonfly wetland, which is upstream, which, you know, you would think logically since as a river, as there's a flooding event, a big rainstorm, you'd think that the wetland that is upstream would fill in more, more quick. Um, but it was actually that the Beaver one, the, the one further downstream, um, filled in or increased in water level more quickly. Um, so the faster fill in rate of beaver could have actually been attributed to an ephemeral stream feeding in from the north. So it could have acted as a regula regulating mechanism, um, causing all of that water to be to have an output into the into the actual Lawson's Fork River. 
So I also measured to, wanted to see how temperature affected um, the wetlands and what the relationship was, and I found that there is an inverse relationship between um, the water levels and temperature, suggesting that temperature uh, is a variable indicator of seasonality. Um, it was actually, it was truly amazing to see how these ecosystems changed just in a period of over a year. I mean, when there's no standing water, the ecosystem is completely different from the ecosystem that is seen when there is standing water. Um, so you can see that, that those changes are relative to water and temperature. So I also um, wanted to see what the inputs of groundwater and the sediments were like in these wetlands. And I installed a piezometer about six feet into the ground near the dragonfly well and compared the water levels about six times during the course of six months. And I found that when there's no standing water, about in this, this time right here, um, the groundwater actually recharges the near surface and it keeps the root zone, root zone moist and allows plants to grow um, in the dry summer. Um, and I also looked at the sediment composition and found that the hydraulic conductivity, which is a measure of how well a substance moves through the soil, uh, decreases with depth, as you can see here. Um, this means that moisture is basically moving through the sediments near the surface and holds in the moisture as you go deeper. So it keeps the roots in moist and allows uh, more vegetation during the dry summer. So the most interesting thing I found was that the wetlands differ most in their response during seasonal transitions, which does not my hypothesis was that they were hydraulically connected year-round, so they would fluctuate similarly throughout the entire year. But I found that that wasn't the case. The case was that they differed mostly when the, the two kinds of ecosystems were transitioning into each other. Um, and I suspect that this is because of an unequal distribution of sediments over time, as, as those flooding events filled in all of those deltaic sediments. Um, and I, also, they're, very, they're kind of different uh, vegetation-wise. So, having those different evapotranspiration rates can impact the amount of water that remains in the wetland. Um, there could also be a sediment barrier between the two wetlands, keeping or not allowing water to move and to fluctuate uniformly. <coughs> and lastly, um, the ephemeral stream that um, I suspect regulates beaver um, can serve as an output mechanism that um, impacts the difference in response between the two wetlands. So some of the future studies that I wish I could stay and continue are uh, the role of the ephemeral stream that feeds into beaver as a regulatory mechanism, also the role of vegetation in the wetland, and also studying the species composition of the wetland. So any questions? differences. So as opposed to a well which I use to measure the water levels, it's not screened or it's screened all the way to the top so water can come in and it's not really you're not really measuring the pressure differences you're measuring the water. So in groundwater it's it's all all the water is kind of uh, kind of in between the sediments so you're measuring the pressure that is released when that water goes up or down. 